Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 33, Military Science Fiction. This topic ended up being quite a bit larger than I expected. A lot larger than you might think if you're only looking at the top 100 or so sci-fi books, particularly in the time period we're looking at now. I regard the 70s and 80s as something of a renaissance in science fiction. Not a large one, but a renewal of the space-oriented sci-fi of the Golden Age and the earlier pulp era. That's been the focus of the past four episodes with things like alien artifacts, and military sci-fi is one more important aspect of that. This subgenre, to an extent, got its start with the very action-oriented pulp fiction of the early 20th century. For example, John Carter and Buck Rogers were both military veterans, and got mixed up in wars in far-off worlds in space and time. But they weren't in the regular army. They, along with Flash Gordon, were all leading revolutions. After all, it's a lot easier to have an exciting story if you're a Rambo-style lone hero than if you're stuck in a mobile infantry unit like Heinlein's Johnny Rico. I think the first big instance of showing an actual space military is Doc Smith's Lensman series. And even then, the Lensmen are technically galactic policemen, not soldiers. But they do work with the regular military, and functionally, they're more like the elite SEAL Team 6 of the galaxy. The series definitely tends more and more to a war story as it goes on. After World War II, a war that itself saw the world go from biplanes to jet fighters to ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons in the span of six years, there was a lot more inspiration to envision a futuristic fighting force in sci-fi, imagining how wars might be fought in the future. The most obvious case is Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers. That wasn't his only book to feature the military, but it was certainly the most central and in-depth, and he was very committed to doing his homework with it. I talked about Starship Troopers at length in episode 15, the second Heinlein episode, so I'll be brief here. It tells the story of Johnny Rico, who joins the Space Marines to attain the greater rights afforded to veterans in his world. The mobile infantry are the front line in a war against insectoid aliens called the Bugs. And Heinlein puts a lot of effort into detailing how a Space Marine force would work, and his philosophical beliefs about how it should work. Things like power armor and jetpacks are heavily utilized, along with various other futuristic weapons. Even today, Starship Troopers is a model for military sci-fi, and you can clearly see its influence in the signposts of the subgenre. But that's just the beginning. There are many more military sci-fi stories that you'll hear about at least in passing, and the first things that might come to mind are movies, and not just Star Wars. Think Alien, Predator, and the like. I think military sci-fi was something of a cultural trend in the late 70s and through the 80s, paralleling the war movies and action movies of the same period. Naturally, it also worked its way into television, both in the West with shows like the original Battlestar Galactica and later Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5, and in the East with animes like Mobile Suit Gundam, Macross, and Space Battleship Yamato. And of course, video games often tend to have a battle mechanic of some kind. Halo, Mass Effect, Starcraft and of course the original Space Invaders. And you could also toss in the tabletop game Warhammer 40,000. Phew, that may beat the record for the most titles in one paragraph in this podcast. Like I said, it's a big topic. And to be honest, a fair treatment might run for multiple episodes. But I'm only doing one for now because I'm not actually familiar with most of them. And after all, the title of this podcast is A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm looking at options to revisit this topic later, but for now I'm going to stick to the books. Although even for books there's a lot of material. For one, I think the subgenre is one that lends itself to series and anthologies very easily. I previously mentioned Larry Niven's Man Kazin Wars anthology series, which released its 15th volume in 2019. Niven was also involved in another military sci-fi series. Jerry Purnell's Codominium series, of which The Moat in God's Eye is a part, is primarily regarded as a military sci-fi series. 
Some of these books parallel the old pulp-era action stories. Fred Saberhagen's Berserker series describes a war against a group of alien doomsday weapons created by a long-extinct species, with a penchant for killing everyone they meet. And Keith Laumer's Bolo series describes wars fought by absurdly huge tanks described as the product of a long arms race that saw main battle tanks grow to the size of battleships, armed with nuclear weapons and spaceflight capabilities. And as an aside, I just cannot find a definitive source for why Laumer called them Bolos. The only other context I've heard the word is as another name for a space tether, which I actually can't find an origin for that either, although it seems to be related to the bolas, a throwing weapon of two balls connected by a string. There was also a B-18 Bolo bomber shortly before World War II, and I can't find a source for its name either. What is up with this word? So, the leading theory is that Laumer's bolo came from a type of Filipino machete, which was known specifically for its versatility as a weapon. But that's only speculation as far as I can tell. If anyone knows something about this, please tell me, because it's really weird that there are so many different usages of this word, and I can't find a clear source for any of them. Anyway, rant over. I don't mean to throw you off with all these titles. I'm just trying to show that there's a lot of material here that doesn't make the top lists, but that you might hear about in passing. And I didn't even list all of them that I could. For this episode, though, I'm sticking with the classic novels, because that's really been the core of this series from the beginning. So, in my opinion, these are the ones you should pay attention to. One thing I've noticed about military sci-fi is that each author seems to have their own gimmick and also their own political slant to greater or lesser degree. Starship Troopers was praised for its innovativeness and attention to detail, but later authors took issue with the politics Heinlein wrote into the book, which come off as pretty jingoistic by today's standards. As other authors wrote their own take on the military in sci-fi, the subgenre changed dramatically. I've previously mentioned Harry Harrison's Bill the Galactic Hero, which is a satirical portrayal of the military, which obviously didn't have such a positive view toward it as Heinlein. And I should clarify that I mean the original 1965 book, not the six-book sequel series that began in 1989 and was mostly ghostwritten. You should be aware that the original is not available on Audible as of this recording, while the sequel series is, so caveat emptor. Much more famous as an anti-war book, though, was Joe Haldeman's The Forever War, from 1974. The Forever War draws clear inspiration from Starship Troopers, but it was very different in tone. Some people have even suggested that the book was a direct rebuttal to Starship Troopers, although Haldeman has denied this, saying it was simply based on his experiences in the Vietnam War. Nonetheless, he takes pains to portray war as a futile and dehumanizing affair, a far cry from Heinlein's portrayal that war is, at worst, the dirty work that somebody needs to do, and at best, a noble pursuit for the good of one's nation. That said, Heinlein reportedly praised Haldeman for the book to his face, saying the Forever War, quote, may be the best future war story I've ever read, unquote. So Heinlein certainly wasn't blind to the dark side of war, and could see the book's merit. The Forever War is distinct in that it is the only one of these military sci-fi books I've seen where the protagonist was actually drafted, which of course also reflects the experience of Vietnam veterans. To clarify, Bill the Galactic Hero was shanghaied into the service, but not legally conscripted. But Haldeman employs the draft in an unusual way. Instead of a general draft, The United Nations conscripts a select group of professional scientists, engineers, and the like, numbering only a hundred or so, at least at first, as an elite task force. This seems kind of odd, and it leads you to wonder if it's symbolic of something else. It's not clear to me, but the impression I get from various opinions I've seen is that a lot of what Haldeman wrote was something of a satire on all the dumb and counterproductive things the military does. For example, when he returns to Earth, the protagonist, William Mandela, points out that war usually speeds up technological progress, but this one slowed it down 
because all the smartest people were sent to the front lines. And that's only the first example. In order to improve morale, the military bunks male and female recruits together in the same bed, encourages marijuana use, and instructs them to swear at their commanding officers in response to orders. Which does seem like a clumsy, bureaucratic response to poor morale. Which many, especially in that era, would accuse the military of doing in its own way. Meanwhile, they don't do anything about the fact that recruits are dying in live fire exercises during training. As an aside, Haldeman does make one major error with the training. Even on comets in deep space, you aren't going to find hydrogen ice. Even where it's technically cold enough to exist, it won't condense in large enough quantities from the primordial nebula when the comets form. This is something we can see by looking at interstellar dust, but it turns out not to be that important. This satire of the military, if that was Haldeman's intention, is only half the story, though. Indeed, I think it's more about the alienation that Haldeman and his fellow Vietnam veterans experienced. Due to relativity, decades to centuries pass on Earth during each mission, and Mandela experiences increasingly extreme culture shock when he returns home. After several hundred years, overpopulation has caused Earth to institute strict rationing and officially encourage homosexuality as a lifestyle. Which seems odd because oral contraceptives were a thing by the time the book was written, but whatever. Eventually, the culture shock becomes so bad that Mandela re-enlists in the military by choice, only to get thrown into more dehumanizing battles. Infamously, it's eventually revealed that the entire war started from a misunderstanding, so it wasn't even necessary in the first place. After all that, it's surprising that Haldeman made the ending as positive as he did. And in retrospect, I feel like the Starship Troopers movie drew more than a bit of inspiration from the Forever War but you can judge that for yourself. Now, The Forever War is actually something of an outlier in this genre. Few works of military sci-fi carry such a strong anti-war message. To be clear, I don't think there are very many that are trying to make a politically pro-war message either. It's just that, like the action stories of the pulp era, or action movies in the present day, war stories are frequently written for entertainment rather than to make a point. However, one story that was trying to make a point was Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. Ender's Game is a novelization of a short story written by Card, written in large part to establish the character for the story he really wanted to write, which was the sequel, Speaker for the Dead. However, Ender's Game has since become Card's most famous work in its own right. Card's unique contribution to the genre is to use child soldiers in his story although not in the usual sense. Ender Wigan, a nickname for Andrew, is a six-year-old boy when he is recruited to battle school. In this world, promising children are recruited to a literal military school in early childhood, where they learn military strategy through games and sports so that by the time they are adults, they've become brilliant officers far beyond what the regular service academies could usually produce. All of this is in preparation for a coming war against insectoid aliens called the Formics, or Buggers. There's that insectoid theme again. Who were only narrowly defeated in two devastating previous attacks on Earth. Ender is a rare exception to an overpopulated Earth's, again, to child policy. Granted on account of his older brother's and sister's high intelligence. Ender, however, far outstrips them and rises to the top of the children's ranks at battle school, defeating all comers on and off the mock battlefield. He does this by a combination of a genuinely brilliant strategic mind and excellent training of his quote-unquote army, but more so by stubbornly refusing to play by the rules when he considers them unfair. And if you're familiar with the story, you may know that, like in the Forever War, things aren't as morally black and white as they appear especially in how the consequences of Ender's actions are hidden from him. I mean, seriously. In the real world, Ender would probably be institutionalized for behavioral problems. But the military is desperate for a win, so they keep going with him. Meanwhile, Ender's sociopath brother Peter and his sister Valentine hatch a plan to take over the world by writing syndicated political columns on the functional equivalent of the internet. 
which I'm not sure if that's blindingly ignorant of how the actual internet works, or brilliantly prophetic of it, except with a failure to understand what it actually takes for things to go viral. It's kind of hard to tell. Next up, I think the most celebrated work of military sci-fi since the end of the Cold War is John Scalzi's Old Man's War series. With Old Man's War, you can definitely see the influence of both Starship Troopers, which directly inspired it, and I would argue also the Forever War, but with a bit more light-hearted, or maybe dark humor, space opera aspects mixed in. In Old Man's War, the gimmick is that, instead of children, the Colonial Defense Force is recruited entirely from old people, over the age of 75. Actually, there's more to it than that. You see, in this future, space colonization is restricted, with only people from certain countries being allowed to go. And more egregiously, the life extension technologies that are rumored to be available from aliens are also restricted on Earth. The reason, again, is said to be overpopulation, which is honestly getting tiresome for a book that was published in 2005. But this time, it's a little different. It's specifically people from overpopulated countries that are short on farmland who qualify for the limited colonization slots. India and Norway are mentioned by name. Of course, as the series goes on, it looks more and more like the whole situation was driven by corruption in the system. I feel like that's also something of a 21st century update on the older stories. But the main focus is still on the military. Our protagonist is John Perry, a retired advertising writer just joining the Colonial Defense Force. He had intended to join with his wife, but she didn't live long enough to go, which sort of pulls the problems of the whole system into focus. Upon joining, he is given a new, genetically modified, cloned body in order to become a super soldier, and he learns some of the truth about the notoriously secretive colonial society. Scalzi does a good job of updating the rigorous, well-thought-out future war technology of Starship Troopers to the 21st century. The old staples are still there, but these super soldiers are also aided by new technologies, like the aforementioned genetic engineering, space elevators, brain-computer interfaces, and nanobots. But he also plays into some of the sillier aspects, like you might expect to see from Douglas Adams such as the one-inch-tall aliens that Perry has to fight by stepping on them. Still, I think Scalzi wrote a worthy spiritual successor to the Heinlein works that inspired him. There's one more series that I would be remiss for not mentioning here, and that's Anne Leckie's Ancillary Trilogy, which is centered around an AI remnant of a destroyed warship searching for answers, and possibly revenge. However, I'm going to leave that one aside for now. For one, it's much more of a political drama than the other works I've mentioned. And it's also more about space battles than on-the-ground fighting like these other examples. And finally, it also falls under transhumanism, which will come up again in a few episodes. It's definitely military sci-fi, and it's a very good series, but it's peripheral enough to the current discussion that I think it's best left for another time. Stay tuned for more on that one. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is hosted by Libsyn and is available on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, etc., etc. I am on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction, where you can also see my new explainer video about negative mass. I'm on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction, and my website is sciencemeetsfiction.com. For my book recommendation, I'm really torn on this one. I actually still consider Starship Troopers to be the gold standard for military sci-fi, despite it being written over 60 years ago. But that would be a third Heinlein recommendation in this series, and more importantly, it's not one that I discussed in depth in this episode. So at the point of wrapping up the script and thinking it over, I decided that my book recommendation for this episode will be Old Man's War by John Scalzi. As I said earlier, it was a very deliberate effort to write the Starship Troopers for the 21st century. I had some minor issues with it, and it's not the hardest of hard sci-fi, but I think it's the best example of showing what military sci-fi can do in the modern era. So I'm going to make that my recommendation, with honorable mention to Starship Troopers.
Now, we've spent five episodes talking about the new science fiction in space in the 70s and 80s. But there's another dimension we need to look at. In the next episode, we explore time travel. Thanks for listening.